Hello, and welcome to the Neural Alignment Model with Todd Ritchie, and I am Lisa Petter. And today, this is the third video in the four-part series about the fear of the loss of a child. In uh, video number one, which you can find on our Neural Alignment Model group page on Facebook, we talked about um, the biological and anthropological um, reasons why you have the fear of a child. And in video number two, we talked about roles, we talked about um, the, the amount of times that um, cortisol stress hormones go up with, uh, you know, if a, a mother is, is not in the picture, if a father's not in the picture. And we talked about really the fear of the loss of a child is a band-aid fear. It's the, it's the superficial fear, and underneath it really is the major fear, which is fear of failure, fear of failure of parenting. And so today, we are going to start to teach everyone how to rewire their brain out of both of these type of fears. So we're going to talk about costs of this addiction, this dysfunctional fear in your life, and then we're going to talk about triggers that can trigger people to start um, acting on this type of fear in very specific ways. So hi, Todd. How are you doing? Great, Lisa. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. So let's talk about the cost in people's lives because addiction always comes with a cost. And any fear um, that, that starts to cause pain and suffering in your life or in your child's life, in this case, someone in your, who is close to you, is an addiction. Yeah, this is such an important point, Lisa, because when you understand the nature of addiction, and of course, if you understand our model, I could break down almost any dysfunctional behavior. And, you know, we always say the truth will set you free, but the number one tool that addiction uses to keep you from truth, from being able to tell the truth, is fear. Mm. And even when you think, no, Todd, addiction doesn't use fear with me, it uses seduction or it uses some other process. But underneath that seduction will be fear. Mm. Like if, if it's, um, you think you're being seduced for a cheesecake, underneath that seduction is some sort of a fear. It's some sort of a void, some sort of an emptiness. If it's like, no, I don't want to get married. I want to be able to sleep with lots of women. And you know, that's my identity. And I'm, you know, I'm this player and I can get all these girls. I can promise you that you feel like it's arousal and seduction. But underneath that is fear, fear of something lacking in you. Right. And when we get down to the deepest part, it's fear of not being able to survive. Yeah, well, everything. Really, levels. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's hard to wrap your head around because I think it's a pretty abstract concept. But, you know, sadly, when the body hijacks or when the brain hijacks the body and, and addiction uses that, <clears throat> that hijacking process and manipulates our body, to have us move in a counterintuitive way towards things that are ruinous and disastrous for our health and happiness, it has to hijack the survival centers of the brain. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, everything we do, at least from the perspective of our model, whether functional or dysfunctional, is either us feeling our body moving us towards something that enhances survival that's been so deeply conditioned, or the addiction hijacking the survival process and making our body feel even more so that if I do or don't do something, that it's even more important for survival. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the underlying core mechanism related to all of these things. Right. So, so driven, a non-homeostasis is driven by fears. It like the deepest levels, fear of survival at the deepest level. So let's talk about what would be a cost? One of the, we've got, a, we've got four costs. So we've got hover parenting is a cost uh, of this fear. Uh, we've got a disassociative parenting. We've got projection of fears onto, from your own fears onto your child. And then we've got um, parents become hyper aware of their children's fears and then hold them to it. So let's talk about the hover parenting. What is the mm -hmm. hover parenting in the person's life and in the children's life? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, <clears throat> it becomes a prison. Mm. I mean, you can imagine that if you're always so, so vigilant, you're ever present, you're always focused, you're, and, and you're doing that always sort of trying to prevent, which means on some level expecting some sort of a negative outcome, so some sort of a painful outcome. So you're living in this state of fear. Now, <clears throat> 
there's there's direct and indirect consequences. I mean, of course, as we just described before, all addiction is driven by fear. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're actually reinforcing a template mm -hmm. that addiction loves. That that at any point it, it, you there could be an arbitrary sort of trauma or experience that then becomes the new and next fear that addiction can latch onto and consistently keep pulling you into some version of dysfunction. Of course, you're gonna end up with anxiety disorders and probably some sort of a phobia, maybe you have panic attacks. And of course, then there's, there's this thing called comorbidity. As I'm what ifing and trying to plan the future away from fear, um, what, what ends up happening is of course, I start to feel a, a pretty chronic case of anxiety. And inevitably, comorbidity, comorbidity sort of speaks to the pendulum swinging to the other side. It's almost like every version of dysfunction, the body in its attempt to regain homeostasis and balance, then has some sort of a physiological, emotional response that swings things in terms of a compensation to pull us out of, in this case, let's say, anxiety. But what it does is it throws us into depression. And that means I can't be in this state of hypervigilance any longer. I'm going to die of an aneurysm or a heart attack. And so the brain says, no, we, we must, you know, change things and gives you this huge infusion of a depressant and just. Bzzz. And so most people then with fear, constant, persistent fear, also not only start to feel that anxiety, but they start to feel more and more depressed. So that's so so that that would go work. <clears throat> that would be the parent and the child would start to experience these high high anxiety and then depressed states because in the in the news you hear it all the time children are more depressed than ever and that yeah. a direct causal relationship to hover parenting yeah i mean a lot of people are right in their assumption that you know, it's high technology, they're being raised on their tablet or a video game or their phones. And all of that is true because those are all disconnectors that can also be a trickle flow of, of, of drugs from the addictive persona's perspective. But it is this template that we are creating, a template, a physiologically, biochemically reinforced template, a way of being, mm -hmm. a way of responding that I start to adopt and think it is somehow my genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. somehow just my personality. This is the, my proclivities. But these are things that are indoctrinated in a sense, unconsciously, the parent passing it down to the child. And, and even though all of these other disconnectors are, are, are really powerful contributors and can potentially be very destructive, it is in fact this emotional template of fear Mm -hmm. that really lays the foundation to be easily triggered, to lack resilience, and to be predisposed to any particular subsequent trauma becoming an easily addictable trauma. And when I, <clears throat> when I take a look at overprotective parents that are constantly sort of sheltering their children and not allowing them to fall down, not allowing them to experience pain, and I've actually literally had parents say, to me this, say this to me with pride, my child has never been hurt. And they're like nine years old. And I'm like, oh, geez, I'm so sorry. They're like, no, what do you mean? <laughs> I've, I've been there every step of the way. They've never been hurt. Like literally, Todd, never fallen down at the park. And I'm like, oh, my God, the effort that you put into damaging, to loving your child and the damage that you've done. Mm -hmm. and, and so to take this further as we sort of flash forward, this is really heartbreaking because this is the most caring parenting generation ever. Parents are more aware, they read more books, they're more committed, and they're goddamn it gonna love so much that what we've done in this loving so much is we've taken the little flower that was the, the seedling of our child's life. And we, we, we treasure it and we keep it inside and it gets a little bit of ambient light, but we, we just sort of keep it inside in the shade and, and the, the flower starts to wilt a little bit. And even though we're giving it water and we're feeding the soil with all these fertilizers and nutrients, it's still wilting a little bit and it's getting weak and we can tell the stem's not very strong. And, 
And so we put it out in the sun. We know on some level, oh, it's got to get some sun, right? Like flowers need sun. And we put it out in the sun, and it's not used to the sun, and it wilts more. And so we pull it back in, and we, we nurture it, and get it, kind of get it back to where it was. And, and then again, you know, maybe a few weeks later, we put it out in the sun, and it wilts more, and we start to believe that, that, that the exposure mm-hmm. is damaging instead of necessary. Right. So now we have, for the rest of this little flower's life, this thin little stem and weak little roots, and, and, and it has to stay inside because it's never built the resilience. When you fa- fast forward that to an actual child, not only do they lack resilience, they lack confidence. They often don't care or don't love themselves, don't like themselves. And when they get out into the real world, the sun metaphor, and it's not as safe, and people don't treat them like perfect mommy and daddy do, mm-hmm. they internalize that. Yes. And inevitably, all these kids, so many of them end up feeling broken, and especially mm-hmm. broken, because they had such a loving mommy and such a loving daddy. And isn't that the source of all trauma and dysfunction anyways? I mean, that's being perpetuated in our culture. And so this kid doesn't even have mommy or daddy to blame. They'll try but they know on their own head, it's like, "Eh, that's not a good reason. I mean, I know this guy that's been through this, 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 and he's thriving now. And and so just because they weren't put out in the sun, they feel inherently less than, inherently broken. And and of course, this drives a desperate need to compensate, to feel better. And so we turn to drugs or or other dysfunctional compensations. And, And I have to say that, the clinics and the retreats and the rehabs and the treatment programs of almost all types are full of what I would say is the biggest trauma happening today. Mm-hmm. And is that is kids that haven't been able to fall down and get up and build resilience over and over again mm-hmm. to not feel broken, that it's not kids that are being neglected. It's not kids that are being abused. It's not kids that are being abandoned. It's kids that are being love too much based on this underlying fear that we were talking about. Right. And it's the hover parenting. It's the hover parenting addiction. It's not the love you're giving them. It's the way it's being given and why if it's driven by fear. And then, so let's go deeper into the fear of the, the fear of failure as a parent that causes this hover parenting. What is the cost? I mean, the costs are fairly similar, you know, for the, for the parent, but this underlying fear that I'm going to fail as a parent, my mm. kids can be smart enough. They're not going to do well on school they're, or sports teams. They're not going to have friends. And a lot of it comes from our own fears in childhood, what we experience, the bullying, the pain. Yeah. To prevent that in our kids. Well, the, the sad part of that is that, you know, every energy that, that we sit with, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, everyone has a little bit of a reference to this. Um, the secret, right? This law of attraction. You don't have to talk about it in magical ways. I mean, certainly when you're dealing with the dynamics that people engage in, um, we can actually see the subtleties with which people attract things. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who walks around like a victim will attract some sort of sadistic impulse, right? I mean, this is, this goes back to the savannah in Africa, you know, where, where the antelope with the limp was the one that was going to get eaten by the lion. And so, we're energetically creating all the time with these energies. Mm-hmm. If we're living in a state of confidence and joy and playfulness, will, will we create more of that? Mm-hmm. We attract people that love to engage and perpetuate that. But if what we're doing is passing down fears to our children, that energy is a creative force. Your fear becomes the creator and fear is such a powerful creator. Mm-hmm. And so, In a sense, you end up creating a story. You end up creating a life. You end up creating an experience through through this energetic fear of attraction where not only you call more things into your life that make it more, in a sense, rational for you to have these protections in place in the first place because look what happened. Thank God we were paying attention. Thank God we have so many defenses in place. Otherwise, my goodness, this could have been a tragedy, which then becomes the evidence for more fear 
-hmm. and then more fear mongering type parenting. In a yeah. sense, we are fear mongering. We are passing these fears down to our kids and creating this experience that really becomes convincing and, and evidence. And, and so again, um, you're creating a, um, a, a core belief system and an identity in really subtle ways that right. lead, that leave this per person absolutely predisposed to co the continuation <laughs> of fear dynamic and living in fear for the rest of their lives. And so but what do I they can, do? I can see that in my daughter with her anxiety. You know, the fear of me having the fear of not being a good enough parent because I didn't have, um, you know, it was just my mom and I didn't have siblings, didn't have close family structure, so had no idea really how to be a parent aside from seeing my mom being a parent, um, you know, was I doing it right? Would I be able to keep them safe? Would I be able to raise a healthy child? Would I be able to not do the things that I didn't like my mom doing? And so that transferred through me with, you know, doing the hover parenting thing when Renee was little into Renee being afraid to get a cheese string out of the fridge. She always mm -hmm. had to ask. Uh, she won't walk down the street to go see her friends. Someone has to go with her. Um, she's afraid to walk down the hallway. She's afraid to do uh, artwork because is it going to be good enough? And those are all things that I can see where my deepest fears that got passed through to her and have become her reality when I just did, I wasn't even conscious of them. I wasn't even conscious of the fact that it was the fear of failure that was driving my behavior and my books That's, and my thoughts, and then they got passed down. Well, and, and there really is a, even a bigger picture tragedy, tragedy. Yes, our treatment programs are full of these kids, but it perpetuates this brokenness, this I'm not good enough narrative, but, but it, it does it in a way, guys, that becomes not only convincing to the kid, but convincing to you, convincing to the teachers, convincing to the peers. So, so let's say, for example, that, I'm going to play soccer for the first time, but I'm just fearful in general. Well, how am I going to step into my first soccer experience with great trepidation, with great reserve? And so I might stick my toe out one time and I'll kick the ball and then I'm going to do something goofy. It's going to look dumb. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncoordinated. And I'm going to like, I suck at soccer. Mm -hmm. like some of those other boys they'd never played before either and they were just or those other girls and they were just whipping down the field and they kicked the ball really hard and it went in the net and it's like wow they're so good at that and then I'm terrified and I'm going to take a math test and I'm terrified and so I sit down and take my math test and all these things I worked at at home with mommy and daddy when things were safe and I was remembering those things what you don't understand is that the fear changes the brain mm. It locks up the body. It freezes you up. Yes. It's like taking a dimmer switch in your brain. And here you are ready to, to you know, tap into your memories and draw out those files and, and ace that math quiz because you, you know all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, here comes the test, and you're fearful. And it's like, and your, your entire neo, neocortex has just like been dimmed with a dimmer switch. Mm. And now do I have access to my memories? Not really. Like some of the stuff I thought I knew, I was like, I thought I knew that. And, and here's the tragedy part. As we live from fear, we start to grow up in the areas where we have evidence that the, that the fear, I don't know it's the fear that made me dumb in math. I don't know it's the fear that made me suck at sports. I don't know it's the fear. I just have the evidence that I did bad at math and then I did bad at soccer, and I did bad at sports, and that becomes the reinforcing narrative. Yeah. Well, why, why should I try anything? Now I'm desperate yes. for one thing. Give me one thing. And maybe I'll take a guitar in my bedroom alone by myself long enough to, to the point where I know I'm good enough that I'll actually bring it out in front of people. And then music sets me free. Mm -hmm. and, and so now I don't do any of these other things, but I'm going right. to just do music. Right. So, yeah. so, you know, this, this, this age of, um, they used to call people a Renaissance man, a Renaissance man as a term women too, where they could just do so many things. You rarely see that anymore. Yeah. People stick to their niche, man. Oh no, I'm good at art. 
I'm good at art. That's what I do. I'm good at art. You know, and sometimes as they get older, we realize that we're suffocating. We realize that we're feeling so broken and, and, and we read enough and there's enough information out there to get me to challenge that fear and to dive right. in. But if a parent was going to give their kid the greatest gift of all, it's not doing their project for them. It's mm -hmm. not helping them get an A. And yes, this term, you know, teach them how to fish, don't get fish for them. But more importantly, challenge them again and again and again, knock them down so that you actually weren't able to knock them down this time. Not in a way that injures them or traumatizes them. I mean, set them up in a way so that they're challenged over and over, but set them up in a way so that they're challenged and can overcome that challenge. Mm -hmm. Set them up in a way where they're challenged and it's not easy and they mm -hmm. still do it. Yeah, so or, or they, they fail mm -hmm. and, and then you help them learn to get back up and try again. That's it. And at the end of the day, your greatest gift that you can give your kid, above anything else, to me, this is the most important thing in life, maybe even more, maybe even more than love. And that's courage. Mm. You give them courage. Yep. Then you give them confidence. I think about this when I was a little boy. When I was a little boy, I was in, my mother was married to a very abusive father. And my mother could verge on the borderline of abusive as well, and certainly in today's standards. But back then, when you gave your kid a, a good whooping, eh, that was sort of par for, the, par for the course. But my father was, was brutally abusive. And the abuse got worse and worse and worse, beating my mother in front of us, beating us children, just completely sadistic. And it was a tragedy. And, and as circumstances played out, what ended up happening inevitably, at least from this little boy's perspective, is that my mother saved my other three brothers and she left my father and took my other three brothers and left me with my father. Mm. Now, <clears throat> the abuse got worse, not better. The assumption was that, oh, you can handle one kid. It's not too stressful. So maybe things will, will improve, but they got worse. Mm -hmm. thank, thank goodness for my Auntie Joyce, who articulated that to my mom at some point. But I was there for three years by myself. Now, this is a fascinating thing. As horrible as my father was, he would put boxing gloves on and teach me how to box from the age of three. And he would smash my head into the TV screen and pop the TV screen or poke holes in the wall with my head and giggle afterwards and think that was funny. But inevitably, he taught me enough skill with fighting. And by the way, I don't recommend this for anybody else. But he taught me enough skill and he gave me enough experiences that were supported by other experiences where in other stressful situations where I would beat some other boy that was much older, much bigger than me, and I would beat him. And all I learned to do in every scenario was fight, which is completely dysfunctional. But because I became a fighter, I was able to apply that. Mm. To everything in my life it's like oh this is scary dive in oh yes. this is scary let's go oh this is scary not run i fight i don't flight i don't freeze i fight mm -hmm. and so i want you to give your kids a fighter mentality without fighting mm -hmm. where they can parlay that into diving into can you imagine how much better at sports i look than the average kid mm -hmm. not because i was more naturally talented i was a little bit slow but i was so fearless Mm -hmm. So I would swing for the ball with everything I got. And if I hit it, it would go a mile. And kids were like, whoa. I would try and kick the ball and kick ball as hard as I could. And because I was so confident and would hit it sometimes, I would figure it out faster. And then I would hit it more frequently and harder. So I got better at sports and better at school and better at everything. And then I would try acting and I was the star. And then I would try singing and I was the star. I would do all these things not because I was naturally talented. Because I had learned how to become fearless fearless yes fearless yeah not really fearless but i acted fearless because if i was scared i faced my fear right wow if you could give that gift to your kids today mm -hmm. give them the fearless gift yeah. give them oh you're going to scare me let's do this and you yeah. face your fear and that's what i do to this day my template isn't a template of freezing and shutting down or running away 
my template is when I'm terrified, okay, that's what I've got to do next. And by yep. the way, big picture takeaway, that's also one of the most effective ways to beat any addiction. Mm-hmm. There's you. Let's go. We tackle yep. that. Think exactly. The that's what I tackle first. Exactly. And, and that's what I learned to do in my life. I didn't have the abuse that you had. I had more the mental <clears throat> type of abuse. Um, and it was facing the fears head on. And so like with my daughter, you know, well, let's talk about what you're afraid of. Let's talk about, let's get down to the core level of where the survival instinct is coming from. What makes that little wasp scare you to death? Mm -hmm. And then let's look at it logically. Is it really logical for you to be in survival mode? And let's face that fear. And yeah, sometimes she runs away screaming because it just becomes overwhelming. But the next time she gets better and the next time she gets better. And then she's comforting the kids who are scared and talking to them. And yeah. it's consistency. Yeah. That's one of your four C's is, is consistency of walking through fear. Yeah, you're not going to get it every time. None of us did. Yeah. You didn't. I didn't. But we keep trying. And that's one of the things that helps rewire your brain. So let's move on to parents that disassociate from parenting. So mm -hmm. they're so afraid they're going to fail that instead of parenting, they're on their phone. Or they literally walk away. Or they work all the time or they're always watching TV. It, it's a fear of failure that causes them to disassociate. Yeah, and these, dis these types of dis disassociation actually lead to specific types of addictions. So it, it, it would come off as sort of like an aloof addiction, and it can create interrogation in kids. It can create, the parent wants that space to just have a little time for chill time, just can I have a cup of tea? But because you're not conscious or aware of this sort of aloof dynamic that you're in, you don't realize you're actually triggering the need and necessity for the kids to be seen, for the kids to be heard. And so what they're doing is they're just going to keep jumping into your space because you didn't satiate them. You didn't fill up their cup. You didn't make them feel seen. They didn't feel safe, which is the first step to the beginning of every healthy dynamic. It's yeah. first yeah. Me feel seen. That makes me feel safe. And then have your cup of tea. Yep. And, so, and a lot then, of parents who hover parent will be like, but I'm always there for them. I'm always right. doing stuff. I'm always, but it's your energy. Cause I can say that with me. I was always there for them, but my yeah. energy was disassociated. I wasn't authentically being there yeah. in a really healthy way. And the kids notice it. So yeah, I'd go to talk on the phone for five minutes to a friend and everyone in the household comes up and starts at me. And I'm like, two minutes ago, nobody was even standing around me. But it's because my energy pulled even further away. My attention pulled further away. And everybody wanted my attention. And it's because I realized, you know, okay, so I'm doing dishes. I'm doing this. I'm kind of listening to their stories. And like last night, my daughter came up to me and she wanted to tell me about these uh, movies that they make with their um, uh, friend from behind them and they play these movies and they do episodes and all this stuff she was really excited about it and yes I was doing dishes when she walked up to me but I made sure I was actually authentically listening not just going uh-huh yeah okay whatever I was like asking questions and I had her up on the counter where I could make eye contact with her Instead of doing the mom thing and multitasking but in the end she felt that I was fully engaged and, and I can honestly say, I honestly did, it was great that they were doing this. I think it's wonderful. Did I truly care? No, like, you know, after a while you're kind of like, that's nice. But I made sure that I really put that energy forward that I was really interested. And I, I, I felt myself starting to disassociate and pop back in and become authentic again. Right. And she really felt that authenticity. And so then when I was talking to her dad three minutes later, she wasn't bugging me. Well, you know how many times, Lisa, you and I have probably spoken to parents and they just can't figure out why is little Susie or little Johnny acting like this? Yes. Um, and, and we automatically start to assume when that behavior becomes a pattern, oftentimes we go, well, genetics or, you know, just their natural tendencies or personality, right? Well, 
in literally every client, thousands of the clients that I've worked with, every single client, I can say this, every behavior comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a model that I'm copying or whether I'm reacting to something mm -hmm. else. And <clears throat> so if, if I'm disassociating as a parent and I'm creating these behavioral responses to my indifference, my apparent indifference, or that I, I'm perceived as not loving, and, and again, we say that it sends kids into survival mode. And what starts to happen is they really start to adopt these very powerful compensations mm -hmm. that become behavioral patterns that literally can become what they think is their personality. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can model and become very aloof by nature. It's not nature. It's very aloof by nurture. Mm -hmm. it's a compensation that they adopted at a very young age. Yeah. But they can also adopt incredible powerful stories and narratives i'll just give you a quick example so i know this guy i didn't do work with him well i did but but it was more he's been more of a friend of mine and he went to a therapist and he came back and he was just so excited and he's like i found out why i talk so much why i have to carry the conversation why i need to be the center of attention why I write stories and movies and plays for a living and put myself in the story and movie and play. It's like, it's very specific. I just simply wasn't heard mm -hmm. as a child. And so a lot of behavior in terms of our compensations is kind of obvious if, we're, if we just take the time to look. Yes. And it's like, oh, that's where that comes from. And it all, guys, listen to me. It all comes from something or somewhere. It might not be the parents. It was at school. It was at the park. It was somewhere. But almost all of our behavior comes from somewhere. And so this guy is just so excited. He's like, wow, I discovered it. I discovered it. And it made so much sense. And this is why I do this and this and this. Whoo, I've got the puzzle put together. But he still didn't get it because that same night as he's describing that to us, he's back in telling another story. Yeah. And he's going on and on and on telling the story. And I'm not kidding you. He's 10 minutes in where no one's really been able to get a word in. And finally, my wife, and if any of you know my wife, she's so patient and she's so lovely and so supportive. And, and she jumped in and she said, oh, hey, Billy Bob. I said Billy Bob because that's not really his name. <laughs> but, oh, hey, Billy Bob, I know, I know exactly how you feel because when I was – and as she was trying to support and reinforce this story that no one had said anything for 10 minutes after he had this big epiphany, he literally pounded his knee and he said, Stacy, I told you I wasn't hurt as a child. You must let me speak. So he takes his, his trauma of dissociation from his parent and then that now becomes not just the explanation for why he does some dysfunctional things, but now the excuse to keep doing them in a dysfunctional way. Yeah. And, and so that's the, also the takeaway. It's like, first <laughs> of all, that's not who you are. That's a byproduct of something that happened. And it may have created something beautiful, this really creative guy. But then for you to hang on to it as a trauma will keep perpetuating the trauma and the necessity for these compensatory yeah. behaviors. And so all of these dysfunctions show up and really for you to heal any pain like that, yes, you face the fear and then you've got to go, oh, and catch yourself and go, oh, wait, mm -hmm. Stacy, I'm so sorry. Here I am prattling on again, 10 minutes without letting you guys get, I'm still acting like the yeah. seven year old that wasn't heard. Please. So in guys. our case, so in our case, hover parenting is the addiction, addictive persona that people have taken on because of fears. It's not who you are. Right. It's the addictive persona. So let's look at projection because I think those two things are super interesting. So you're projecting your own fears onto your child or you had said to me, you take your child's fear and you become yeah. hyper aware of it, that you hold that fear for their life and keep them reliving it. So explain that situation. Uh, this just happens so often. Um, so one time I worked with this family and the young man really can't be helped over a weekend. It's just too intense. And so 
um, there's, there's different treatment programs and he had a severe drug addiction. And, and the fact that he participated as well as he did was remarkable and he was very engaged. And this kid wanted to change his life. He was motivated. This sort of love intervention that we did that I've developed worked so well with him, with him. Now, <clears throat> we had already alluded to where his dysfunction came from. He was another example of hover parenting, over loving, right? And, and he had such low self-esteem because he had never really accomplished or done anything. And at the age of 25, on his way to treatment, his mom's like, well, I'll make you some lunch. I'll hear some sandwiches for you. And I'm going to, and so she's like, but you know what? I don't, I, I want to see the program. So her and her husband come, we fly. I don't remember how far from the East coast to Arizona. <laughs> let's say, I think that's what it was. And here we are in Prescott, Arizona. And I'm introducing them to the owner of the program, this lovely woman. And, and so she takes us on a tour because it's clear. Mom is still really like, you better look after my boy. And he's here, boy, I tell you what, man, I'm, we're trusting you. And, and she's like, don't worry, you know, we're going to look after him. And, and, but, but I'm already seeing the pathology, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm also seeing is the mother projecting not just her fears. She's unconsciously or consciously trying to project back into her child so that the child reinforces the fears that the mother's having and feels them and then convincing everybody else how incredibly threatening this might be. And so as we're walking through the program, maybe there's 10 other um, men there. Well, where is he going to eat? Where is he going to eat? Well, he just what, this is a communal area, and he's going to eat with the other men in this area. It's like, really? So he doesn't get a private place to eat? There's no private place for him? He can, like, if he needs to get away? And then we go to, so where is he going to sleep? Well, there's almost but there's a teeny little window. There's no light coming in through this window. How is he supposed to? And I'm not kidding you. He's going, Mom, Mom, it's okay. I want to do this. Mom, I'll be fine. It's just a window. It's, it's okay. I can go outside. Whatever. We finished this tour after maybe an hour of the mom trying to sabotage the son, trying to sabotage his intention and his success. Literally, she start, we start to walk out and, and the son's going to say, stay. And they say, goodbye, mom. I love you. Thanks for letting me do this. And she walks into the middle of the front yard, not on the sidewalk, onto the grass. And I'm suspicious. And then she faints. Of course. <laughs> out cold. Now we have to call the ambulance. Ambulance comes and she's like, Johnny, Johnny, come with me. And he gets into the back of the ambulance. Rides away with his mom and never ends up going to the treatment program. Mm -hmm. Honestly, don't know how he's doing now. I'm heartbroken. I can't break down the game. I can't call her enough and say, look, you're, you're sabotaging this for your kid. Do you want him to get... This is the projection, but this is also the codependency as I'm passing down my dysfunction to you. And I don't want to feel like a broken parent. I need to keep playing the role of fixing you and yeah. making sure you're okay. I'm as equally addicted to that as you are now to the dysfunction of self-loathing and drugs or whatever it is that you're doing to compensate for feeling so crappy about the ways that I've overprotected you. And now I'm stuck. Well, and, and also they want someone to share in the narrative so it really is it even stronger i've seen that with people that i coach where you know the parent has a fear and the child enables the parent to keep having this fear and keeps helping the parent have this fear and the fear gets worse for the parent which goes on to the child and it just becomes this back and forth dynamic of you know and then the the child eventually starts to break free of it and then it's this control you can't leave because if you leave my narrative won't be as strong no, nope. well, I want to be careful. Me. Yeah, you're right. I, I want to be careful here too because, you know, I've actually literally lost clients because as I explain these codependent, sort of codependent sort of enabling type dynamics that happen, the parents think I'm blaming them. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the it's the horrible mother. That's right. Let's the guilty mother. That's it's my fault that my son's doing drugs. I don't want people to pick up that that's what we're trying to say. Yeah. What we're trying to say is that 
you can't be in a relationship without creating a dynamic in the relationship. It's mm -hmm. impossible. It doesn't exist. I've never not worked with a family where the son or the daughter is dysfunctional, eating disorder, addicted. And I'm telling you, loving parents, so they won't look at their own behavior because they're so caring and so loving. You've got to see that it's this over-lovingness that doesn't allow them to thrive. Mm -hmm. You don't get that. Yeah, you're going to feel offended, you perfect mother and father, when I tell you that some of the things that you're doing is hurting your kid. You're going to be offended. And it's going to be, to you, an automatic cliche, right? It's the mother's fault. Screw you, pal. You know, um, I'll fix my son myself. Thanks for trying. Yeah, yeah well, I can say that. When I first uh, was dealing with Renee's anxiety, we went to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, I think, and we walked in and he's like, it's you. You're the one who's causing all the problems to me. And of course, at that point, I was livid. And I could feel it inside that he was right. But I didn't have enough information to go, well, that's great, but what the hell do I do with that? And so I got mad and I walked out because the last thing you want to hear when you know there's a problem is it's you. Right. But then through using your model and other things that I was learning, yeah, it was me. But it wasn't because I was doing it on purpose. That's the thing. Addiction is not usually on purpose. Addiction comes from fears that are passed down, epigenetics. That's the key. Things. And, and once I really embraced it and went, yes, okay, I've created this, how do, I, how do I rewire my brain for me and for her? That's when I started to heal. And in fairness to you, you know, you'd be able to look back and look at the dynamics now as you understand the intricacies of human behavior and how dynamics work and how addiction passes down. Yep. from generation to generation. Not just alcohol addiction passes down. No. Every Everything. kind of addiction passes down. More specifically, our underlying emotional addictions, which we can yes. talk more about at some point. But then how far back do you have to go to really blame? It's like, well, yeah, but my grand great-grandparent did this to my dad, which then he did. And, well, I mean, it's pointless, isn't it? I mean, you understand the nature of dynamics. These things pass down, not just within the family. Guys, at some point, we're mm -hmm. going to talk about how these pass down culturally. Mm -hmm. you know, where there's a collective cultural trauma, like a First Nations trauma, which is, you know, this amazing, egregious genocide beyond anything that we can conceive. And we wonder after a hundred years later, why don't they get over it? Because you don't get it. You don't understand it. They don't either but there's reasons that these traumas perpetuate generation after generation after generation. In the First Nations cultures that I work with, they talk about it being eight generations to heal these types of traumas. Now, I don't agree with that, and I think it's counterproductive belief system. I don't think it serves you, but I understand why they say that. And now there's science supporting what they're saying, in fact, but that also can be broken down. You think about slavery and why things are still to a degree dysfunctional as it relates to race relations in the inner cities of Chicago and LA. We can't really get the scope mm -hmm. of severe traumas and the imprint, the visceral yeah. poor impact that it has, and then how that becomes a self-perpetuating trauma that creates specific emotions and feelings that we unconsciously go through processes of recreation. Yeah. Well, and I know for me, the biggest thing was, it wasn't about blame. I wasn't looking to blame anyone. I was looking to go, and I had just finished a whole bunch of ancestry stuff on every single side of the family. So I understood the dynamics. Mm -hmm. I understood why my mom acted certain ways. My dad acted certain ways. I could see why I was acting certain ways. I wasn't looking to blame. I was thinking, oh, now I understand. I can feel compassion. I don't need to blame anyone. I can start changing and walking through these fears. Looking for someone to blame, that's an addiction too. Yeah. You know, I know this might be, this might be off point a little bit, but it's just jumping into my head. I think the book that I read was Super Freakonomics and this, this statistic just blew me away as we're really starting to try and give space for traumas that have happened to us and understanding human behavior and where things come from. So the story of the Hatfields and the McCoys. So here we are in the Appalachian Mountains in, in Eastern United States. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the Hatfields and McCoys. This idea of family feud 
it came from this region where family after family after family was taking turns killing each other mm -hmm. for 150, 200 years. Yeah. And so then these stat statisticians did the research and they finally sort of traced it back that almost all of these people, specifically the Hatfields and the McCoys, were Irish, I mean, were Scottish Highlanders. Well, there's a lot of old European areas where there were Highlanders. And all these Highlanders, whether it be in Corsica or, or Greece or, or Scotland, all these areas that were Highlanders, almost all of them were herders. People that, that go to the mountains herd goats or sheep or this or that. And apparently, this incredible overprotectiveness of your clan came from the overprotectiveness of your flock. That if you literally lost one sheep, that could mean life and death. And so you certainly had to establish this incredible protectiveness of your flock. If somebody could take one sheep, then maybe they could take five. And so there had to be powerful reprisals and consequences. Okay. And so now that morphed into somebody walked into the store and looked at my son the wrong way. And then I killed them. They killed me. I killed them. And 150 years later, we just take turns killing each other. And it became from this incredible hypersensitivity. And then I find out that my wife's family, the father comes from a Basque region of France, which is also a mountainous region. And I can't figure out why they're so as a family rabidly territorial and protective of each other. Like literally, you know, one of their kids could throw a rock and hit you in the head and you'd go, bitch, why'd you throw that rock? And you would be hated for five years for saying bitch. And it's yeah. like, so, so the conditioning is so powerful. Mm -hmm. It comes from so many sources and it gets passed down in ways. Yes. Epigenetically. Yes. Through the sperm and the egg. Yes. Through behavioral patterns. Yes. Through addictions. And, and here we are thinking that we're these unique people, but we're playing out these roles. We're playing out these traumas. Um, and, and so I, I'm going on, but I just, the more I do this, the more complexity, the more I understand the subtlety and nuance of what drives human behavior. And well, your and awareness. Can, yeah. As and you we say, can look at it and go, oh my God, how can you ever get over this? Because it does. Like the complexity you just add, and you're like, I will never get over this. But that... That's where the neural alignment model comes in and goes, it doesn't matter how far back it goes. This is about understanding why you act the way you act. Then when you do that, then we're able to actually rewire the brain out of it, no matter how much epigenetics or passed down or, or conditioning from your parents, we all can walk through it. You and I have done it. We have taught people to do it. And so, yes, there is complexity upon complexity, but the model makes it very simple to walk through um, rewiring your brain. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about yeah. In, yeah. In, the, in the last video. So let's sum it up because we've been talking for a while. What else do you have to say about this? And then we'll wrap it up and then we'll move on to um, the massive action and the triggers in the, in the next video? So I guess, you know, just sort of as a prelude maybe, or as a cliffhanger, what I'll want to talk about more also in terms of just specifically what to do about it, but it's just some basic concepts that I think, you know, brain science is also very complex. So now you take the complexities of human behavior and then you sort of superimpose it over the complexities of brain science. And wow, you've got this very confusing hodgepodge of what the hell do I do? Mm -hmm. But I also then want to make sure that I'm always doing things that we're always doing things that mm -hmm. simplify yeah. because anybody can overcome any trauma, any pattern. There's nothing that controls your behavior when you choose to be accountable and take control of your behavior. Now that's a simplistic answer. And um, so there's always this tension between, yes, I understand the complexities of your, of the complexities of your problem. Let me prove that to you. And so I express my understanding. I show compassion. I show empathy. I show love. I take more accountability. Um, and, and then from there, we can create uh, um, hope through communication at a different level. And so just trust that I know that there's a process to this, mm -hmm. but I'm going to jump ahead. So this, the most powerful saying to me, I already said, I think the most important thing you can teach your kids is courage. Because courage gives you the, the ability to tell the truth better. 
Mm -hmm. through your actions and your experiences. Courage gives you the ability to tell the truth better. And the saying the truth will set you free, as I relate it to brain science, really, really rings true now. And I'll take this one step further and we can talk about it more, but I will simplify all human happiness and illness and disease and psychopathology that if this is a representation of my ability and willingness through courage to tell the truth. And that that includes my cognitive processing, the way that I perceive, the way that I filter, my internal dialogue. So this cognitive part, if it includes my senses, my senses, and, and then it includes all of my emotions, all being aligned and being able to tell me the same truth Mm -hmm. that there's no conflict between the different three categories. Mm -hmm. And that if I can tell the truth with my senses, with my emotions and with my mind in the present moment, all at the same time, to the degree that I can do that will speak to my happiness and my health. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, there are certainly certain ex examples like a war in Syria that might make that harder, but I promise you, they still celebrate weddings and births of babies. Even in spite of the fact they're going through war, they're still happy people going through war. It's a different type right. of happiness. And, and what you may not know what Todd's doing with his hand is when you read the Neural Alignment Model book, we have two arrows, and in the center is the homeostatic balance, and that's what is what Todd is showing you, is the homeostatic right. balance. Yeah. And you'll see that in the Neural Alignment Model book, which you can get through our website. And so, but to the degree that you, what, this way or that way, whether you're taken away from truth of who you are or you're, or you're so desperately needing to be that truth of who you are that it gets pushed out of balance in either way, to the degree that you can't tell the truth, to the degree that you have some story that's not working for you, is directly correlated with the amount of pain, unhappiness, suffering, and illness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so. If I'm a paranoid schizophrenic and I see little green men with space guns and I, my body responds like that is real, I'm way over here. I can't tell the truth. If I have anorexia and I want to create a beautiful body and I'm losing weight to the point that I'm 75 pounds, I don't, I look in the mirror and I see a fat girl and I just got off the scale and it said 75 pounds. What a simple, do you get what I'm doing? How simple mental health physical health and happiness is directly related to your ability to and willingness through mm -hmm. courage to tell the truth and and i would challenge you to find somebody really sick <laughs> other than maybe if they lived at three mile island there's certain things that can make us sick that there are exceptions to this rule but in almost all cases even people that look happy have some latent deep hidden trauma that's unprocessed Yes. And so, so happy because they won't ever get angry and they won't process or purge their anger. They're so uncomfortable with it. And the people will say as they die of cancer, no, but she was the happiest person I've ever met. Yeah, because she didn't give herself any space for a broad range of expressing different emotions that were appropriate and justified. Well, so, and this is where if you look back to the secret, people talk about there's layers and layers and layers and layers of healing. And you never get to a certain point where I'm done. I, I don't know because there's there's subconscious things that have been passed down that until you're triggered or you can tell the truth about them, you know, that it might, I make people uncomfortable because I will say, yeah, I was a terrible mom for a, a long time. I was a really bad wife, but I can admit the truth of what I had done because I know the backstory. And yes, I wasn't great with certain things, but now I go, that was the truth then. This is the yeah. truth of me now. And five years from now, I'll look back and go, whew, yeah, you know, we're always evolving. And that's the part of rewiring your brain. It's not once. It's a continual process of, of coming to new truths of who you are authentically. So hover parenting hurts the parents. It hurts the children in many ways that we've detailed comes from this underlying fear of I'm a failure I'm going to be a failure 
in life, in survival, and, and it's reinforced by society because when you look at movies, when you look at comedy shows, when you look in the media, all they're talking about is hover parenting, hover parenting. And in the movies, they're showing it as funny, but everybody's doing it. And if you, like we talked about in, in video number two, if you have no source or tribe around you that has healthy parenting skills, you're going to see what's in the world around you and copy it because that's all you know to do. So there's no blame here. This has come up from many levels, but the truth, when you admit it and go, yes, I hover parent. I'm a hover parent. I can see the problems it's causing in my life. I can see the problems it's causing in my child's life. And you go, I want to be truthful about this and I want to start rewiring my brain. That's when you're ready to do it. Because blaming and you're still in the addictive mode. So when you're ready to be truthful and authentic and work through it, that's why we're here. We're here to help everybody. And let me just make, a, a, <coughs> sort of create a challenge for anyone who watches this, okay? So there's this other belief that sort of reinforces that the, the truth will set you free and to the degree that you have the ability to tell the truth. So you're not off track. You're not broken. You don't have a disease. We don't label you just can't tell the truth. You see, you're not broken, you're not horrible, because that came from somewhere. So all we have to do to heal is to learn and commit to tell the truth and learn how to. So our model is about really creating that framework that gives you that, but here's my challenge. I want you to think about anyone that you know, anyone in your family, anyone in your life, anyone you know of, or anyone that you've read their autobiography, anyone in the history of humanity that this doesn't apply to. Their belief system, their core beliefs, create their very specific behaviors that support those core beliefs, and those behaviors ultimately create that person's reality, their experience. And then that reality and experience will be reinforcing in a sense, and it'll go all the way back and they'll go, see, those core beliefs, those were right, see? And it becomes this reinforcing sort of feedback loop. And my challenge to you is to see if there's a person out there that you can think of that that doesn't apply to. No, no, their life experience is completely different than their beliefs. Please, please, if you can, find me that person because we want to do a movie about that person if we can find them. But, but, but do challenge yourself. If you can think of anyone that you know that that doesn't apply to, I'd love to address it in our next video. Perfect. Well, this has been a great talk about the underlying belief systems that, that create fears, that create, which then creates the addiction, which creates our thoughts, behaviors, and actions. So in video number four, we're going to get into the triggers that cause behavior to cause hover parenting and then the massive action that we can begin to take to rewire the brain and then the four C's which help us be consistent in telling our truth and rewiring our brain. So I will see you in the next video, Todd. All right. Take care, Lisa. Bye, guys.